Welcome to this PCR webinar series on transcatheter aortic valve implantation. This webinar will address tarving and access to the coronary arteries. My name is Lars Sandergaard. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Copenhagen in Denmark. And with me here in the PCR study is Giuseppe Tarantini from Padua in Italy and Thierry Lefebvre from Paris in France. So before we start, maybe I can ask you, uh, Giuseppe, what does coronary access and TAVI mean to you? Thank you, Lars. This is actually is a really hot topic. And uh, what we can say, two brief consideration, just to set up the discussion, or the further discussion of the webinar. The first one is the prevalence of coronary artery disease in trial and registry of patients treated by TAVI that is about 50 up to 80%. So it's quite a large number of patients that has both disease, severe artery stenosis plus severe coronary artery disease. And the second point is looking at the low risk patient and mainly younger patients with long life perspective, you know, that the likelihood to have, you know, some kind of coronary access because of, you know, unstable angina or stable angina or for other reasons, you know, we have the need to re-engage the coronary artery, you know, this risk is concrete. So for me, this is one of the important things to discuss. And for you, Thierry? Yeah, so I think uh, 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 risk of TAVI occlusion is also an important issue, of mm. course. It's not frequent, it's about 1%, but uh, the, it's, it's a very a dramatic complication. Mm. So it's very important, in my uh, opinion, to be able to identify uh, the, the risk of coronary occlusion using MSCT uh, before starting the procedure and to, to protect or prepare the patient in order to avoid this mm. kind of complication, or maybe sometimes to uh, take another decision that can be surg sur a surgical decision. So that was a good start. So um, today uh, we're going to talk about how to learn more about when to intervene for coronary artery disease prior to a TAVI procedure, understand how to protect coronary arteries at risk for occlusion during a TAVI procedure, and also to try to improve your understanding on how to access the coronary arteries after a TAVI procedure. So before we move on, please uh, remember this is a live webinar where you at any time can send your comments and questions to us and we'll try to address them here. I'm going to start showing a few slides here. Uh, this is all TAVI valves we got today. You can, try to, you can divide them into three groups. Those who got a low stent frame with an insular position of the leaflets and those who have a high stent frame where the leaflet can be in an insular position or in a superinular position. And we all know that even though it's possible for these valves to access the coronary arteries, it can be difficult if you don't have the experience to it. And it's also difficult because when we implant this TAVI valve, the valve may sit with alignment to the native valve, so you have commercial alignment, but it's going in randomly, so it can also be a misalignment, so you have the post in front of the entrance to the coronary arteries, which of course is going to make your access even more difficult. And also remember that uh, today the patient we're treating are quite old. In most studies, mean age is around 80 years. So let's assume that patient is going to live to his 85. So that patient got five years of life expectancy. And even though we don't know the, life ex uh, the durability of this TAVI valve, let's assume it's 10 years. So durability is not an issue today because the valve is going to survive the patient. But with the new low-risk trials, there's an expectation we're going to move down to patient with a longer life expectancy. Let's say a patient who today will receive a surgical biprosthetic aortic valve is going for TAVI instead of. And if that patient is going to live to his 85, he got 25 years of life expectancy. So you can see that that patient will need not only a TAVI, but a TAVI and TAVI, and maybe a TAVI and TAVI procedure. And that will also impact the access to the coronary arteries because when you implant a new TAVI valve inside, the leaflets of the first valve is going to be pushed aside and create a tunnel of tissue. It may not be a major issue for the two types to the left, but for those with a high stent frame and a super position of leaflets, you have a tunnel of tissue extending from the LVOT through the sinus of a salva and ST junction. So in those patients, it'll be very difficult to access, maybe even impossible, the coronary arteries. And that can, of course, be a 
major issue in case the patient is admitted with acute coronary syndrome. So let's start, um, uh, Giuseppe, maybe you can give us a case of a patient who is referred for TAVI who got known coronary artery disease. Perfect. So let, let's start with this case. Female, 77 years old, with an intermediate surgical risk because of STS of 6%. The medical history, the patient's got some moderate atherosclerotic carotid disease with a previous TIA. Two years previously, the patient got you know, a diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis that was, at this stage, asymptomatic. Actually, the patient uh, you know, was admitted in our hospital because of dyspnea, uh, near class 3, without any sign of angina, stable angina or unstable angina. So this is the echo to the echo that shows clearly that there is a calcific hypermobile valve where the mean gradient is 40 millimeter of mercury, the aortic valve area is below 1, and the index value is below 0 0.6. The leaflets uh, are quite calcific, and the left ventricle is normal, both in terms of dimension and left ventricular ejection fraction. Here you can see, you know, the angio, the coronary angio of the left and the right coronary. As you can see, there is a kind of do left dominance with a diffuse disease that might be moderate at the level of the circ, but there is a diffuse, apparently severe, uh, lesion at the level of the LAD. You know, it's difficult to say if it is focal or diffusely, you know, significant. But what is impressive on the right-hand side of this slide is the calcification, the amount of calcification of the coronary artery, especially uh, the, the LAD that is diffusely and heavily calcified. And this is quite important. So maybe I can just uh, st stop you here for a second, uh, Giuseppe. So if you go one back here. So to re, uh, we see that uh, the CT scan actually revealed quite a lot of calcification in this patient. Some sites uh, will use the CT scan to look whether the patient has any sign of coronary artery disease, and if there's no sign, they would not do a normal angiography. W what is your take on this? Is this something we could apply to most of our patients? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting point. Uh, today we are doing a coronary angiogram in the majority of cases in my center, but I, I truly think that in the future, because we are going to treat more and more younger patients, a CT scan can be a way to simplify the screening of the patient. Uh, and the quality of CT scan is becoming uh, better and better. So I think it could be a very nice option to select the patient according to CT scan and, uh, yeah, and uh, remove this uh, step of coronary angiogram. I agree with that also because of the negative predictive value of the CT scan. That when you don't see Sorry. any calcification, calcium, it's, you know, it's the faster way to go. So moving on to the case, so this is the MDCT analysis. Here you can see the value, uh, the numbers at the level of virtual basal ring, sinotubular junction, and the level of ascending aorta. Uh, the, uh, the mean, the derived mean diameter, was about 23, okay? And uh, as you can see at the level of the sinuses, the measures are about 30 millimeter. So the sinuses are not so shallow. And then the sinotubular junction is, uh, you know, about 27 millimeter between 26 and 28. Related to the peripheral vasculature, as you can see, it's, it is quite clear with the minimum uh, minimum reference mass diameter that is about seven. So we are quite okay with all different potential valves. And then related to the calcium score at the level of the valve, as you can see, the calcium estimated calcium score was one. So at that point, I think uh, it's important also with, for the audience, you know, to start thinking about the first crossroad of this case. It is how to assess and when to treat potentially this coronary artery disease and which valve to select in these patients. So that's the point I would like to try to discuss with you, starting from this, from the guidelines. In 2018, his guidelines recommend with the level of evidence C, that means that we don't have so much data, 
robust data with this regard, but it's an agreement in the task force, the PCI should be considered in patients with a primary indication to undergo TAVI and coronary artery diameter stenosis that is about 70%. That is quite, you know, a, it's very similar recommendation to what we have when we have to, you know, graft the LAD in uh, during a standard surgical procedure where we go with a standard aortic valve replacement. Related to the American guidelines, we don't have any other any specific recommendation with this regard. So, <clears throat> the, uh, what we can do with this case, if we follow, you know, uh, the, the guidelines, we have to, you know, revascularize this patient, but we have to admit that we have a huge calcification, diffuse disease, so the PCI is a very complex PCI that may be very risky in a patient with severe aortic stenosis. So to me, I think what is reasonable is to try to understand if this lesion is a discrete lesion or a diffuse disease, because it may matter in terms of what we're doing first. So in one case, if we find out that we have a focal lesion, we can treat focally uh, the lesion at the level of the coronary and then moving to the TAVI. Otherwise, the way around, if we have a diffuse disease by mean of physiology evaluation, it's better to go first for TAVI and then to make a kind of another physiology assessment to understand the, after the relief of the severe aortic stenosis that if there is or not some changes in term functional meaning of this lesion. So two things, two things. The, the, the slide is a little bit busy but I think we can summarize very quickly because these here are reported some potential pitfall of traditional fraction for reserve evaluation in the context of severe aortic stenosis. First of all we don't have formal validation because we don't have study dedicated to that because fame patients did not have any severe aortic stenosis. The other point is that when we go with the fraction for reserve, what we need to have is a maximal vasodilatation. And in the context of severe aortic stenosis, <clears throat> maximal hyperemia might be, you know, blunted, hampered by the presence of, you know, the afterload mismatch that we have usually in this kind of patient. So there is what is so-called in literature tandem stenosis effect. That means that the aortic stenosis works as a lesion that stay downstream any other epicardial lesion. Then there are some concerns about the administration of vasodilator like adenosine in this context because we don't want to have, uh, you know, heavy block or hypotension, <laughs> etc. And finally, we have to admit that also the IFR or other diastolic index did not have any formal validation because we don't have also for this kind of indexes, you know, formal studies with this context. But there is a but and probably the, this slide is important to understand that there are some different physiological plausibility to go for IFR, that, that means the stolic index only, compared to, you know, an index that is a mixing of systole and diastole in the context of aortic stenosis. Here you can see we have 27 patients with severe aortic stenosis without any coronary artery disease. So un unobstructed coronary arteries. And what the authors did in this paper is to evaluate the average peak flow, the flow velocity within the coronary artery. And what they found is that doing this measurement before or after TAVI in resting condition, we won't see any changes in terms of <clears throat> average peak flow. But when we use maximal hyperemia and vasodilation, relieving the, the stenosis with, the, with TAVI means that we'll increase significantly the average peak velocity. How it turns out, this, this data? This is the second paper that is complementary to the previous one because in this case we have 28 patients again <clears throat> with severe aortic stenosis plus severe coronary artery disease. And as you can see on the left hand side, there is no difference in terms of flow uh, when we measure PDPA or IFR, but when we move to FFR, that means in using maximal vasodilatation, we have a significant increase in the flow. That means, again, looking at the right-hand side of the panel, that you have a reduction. That means that the stenosis that doesn't seem to be significant, it becomes significant after 
the positioning of prosthesis at the level of the aorta when you go with FFR, but the, 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 this value is quite stable when you go with IFR. So going back to the case, what we did is we used IFR <coughs> in resting condition to measure, you know, the mini, the the, the uh, clinical significance uh, of this of this lesion, and what we found out is that the the value was below 89. That means that means significance, but 88 and 89 is almost there, so it means a very 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 mild ischemia. But if you look at the pullback, that means the scouting, the IFR scouting. This is a very diffuse disease, so we don't have any single spot that we can, you know, fix and, you know, solving the, 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 the most part of the problem. So the thing is that we have a very mild ischemia, but we have a diffuse disease, very calcific. They need for a full lesion coverage, so that means a very complex PCI. This is the reason why <clears throat> We decided to select the strategy number two, that means to go with the TAVI first, to reassess by physiology the uh, functional meaning of that lesion, diffuse disease, and uh, you know we decided to select uh, um, a valve that permits a secure uh, disease access of the coronary artery because as you can see in the, in the picture at the right hand side of the, of the slide, it is possible if you stay with the wrist plane below the coronary artery, it's easy to engage whatever is the catheter that you use. So this is the procedure. We selected the mean, the mean diameter was, was 23, so we decided to go with a 26.2 cc less because the sinus width was about 30, so we were quite confident about the fact that we don't risk too much in this patient. We didn't want to have any leakage. And uh, you know the final result <clears throat> is uh, is quite is quite good because we don't have uh, any uh, you know we don't have even a mild regurgitation. So at that point we re-engaged again the coronary artery. As you can see with the catheter, it is possible to stay above the frame of the valve, and the IFR was quite stable because it was 86 compared to 88. It was pretty the same. And again we decided because of the difficulties of this kind of uh, you know procedure, uh, with um, the difficulty of the procedure, and on the other hand, you know the fact that we have a, a very mild very mild, uh, you know, ischemia based on this value, we decide to leave out the patient as it is, because also this patient didn't have any angina. It's, you know, three years of follow-up, uh, the patient stay well and is still in uh, Canadian class zero. So this is my last slides as related to the case, just to share with you this data that is, um, this data that belongs to a paper that has been submitted. This is a prospective European registry in a European center, about 2,000 patients treated with Sabian 3, a three-year follow-up. They need for getting a coronary access because there was a clinical indication to do that was only 3%. We have to admit that in this case, uh, you know, the average, the mean age of the patient was above eight years and very few patients, it is below 20%, uh, uh, had an age that was below 75 years. And as you can see, the need for cannulation was right coronary artery, circumflex was LAD, so the, the data is quite, you know, uh, spread out, so we don't have any specific uh, vessel to be, to incannulate, and the result is the following, that in, uh, all cases, when you go with this type of valve, it is a short frame, you can get a selective coronary access. So this is a good news because you know, in perspective, thinking also at young and lower risk patients, this might be one way to go. Thank you. So that's also very reassuring that three years after TAVI, only 3% of the patient actually need to go for a coronary angiography. And it seems that with the right valve, it's going to be successful for all patients. You said we got a questions uh, online here, and you already mentioned, but maybe you can just summarize it. Uh, what validated physiological evaluation do we have? Uh, you talked about FFR, IFR. So just very short. What's what's uh, 
Yeah, okay. As I said, you know, this is a good point. Uh, we don't have, you know, formal validation because we don't have randomized trial, prospective study, just focused on that with a large number of patients because we have some papers on that, etc. So actually, we don't have anything with this regard, but there are ongoing randomized trials that will evaluate angio-based versus functional-based mm -hmm. revascularization in the context of TAVI. The name of this trial is FITAVI. Mm -hmm. It has been registered also in a clinical trial.gov. The other point is that in the absence of uh, robust data, we have to trust all, uh, also on what is the physiological plausibility of what we do. And so what I try to say is that having a diastolic only index seems to be a little bit more stable mm. as value mm. uh, compared to another index the need to you know the needs for a maximum vasodilatation and this a mix of diastole and systole so it's a kind of average mm. so this is my point of view second question is um, let's say you want to do an IFR or FFR after TAVI is there any time which is better than other what how long should you wait does it matter i uh, the relief of, of the after low mismatch is immediate because mm. when you go with the, with the valve, the endostolic pressure used to reduce very, very fast. I don't have data mm. to say if, you know, early versus late mm. evaluation will change something because I think it's something different compared to the acute myocardial infarction mm. where when you have edema that need to be reabsorbed. In this case, we have something that is very mechanical. So when you sort out the problem at the level of the stenosis, in the vast majority of cases, if you go with the pigtail, the endostolic pressure used to recover quite immediately. Mm. So I don't think it's, it's so remarkable. So, Thierry, maybe at, at, uh, I can ask you, let, this patient had a mild, diffuse disease. Let's say you have a patient coming for TAVI who have no angina, who got a discrete, significant lesion proximal on LAD. What will favor to revascularize and what will favor to leave it? So because you said that the patient is asymptomatic, I will be in favor of not doing anything on this vessel because it's a mid lesion or moderate lesion. Of course, if we have a critical lesion of the proximal LED or the left man, uh, for safety reason, we'll uh, treat this lesion before uh, the TAVI procedure. Then there is some, some cases where you are in intermediate position and uh, especially patient with multivessel disease with uh, diffuse disease, so in these cases uh, we, we like to do uh, FFR. Mm. So we think that, uh, especially for the left man, so we think that FFR is probably more reliable than IFR, but of yeah, course I have case, no yeah. data about, mm. uh, about mm. that, so uh, mm. just uh, what we are doing. Mm. More plausible. <laughs> you say, but does it make any difference whether the patient have a reduced ejection fraction, whether you want to revascularize or not? Now this is a very an, another very important point because again it depends also on the complexity of revascularization and on the amount of ischemia because if you have a very low ejection fraction you, usually this patient has also you know a dilated heart etc. If we have a gradient of artery stenosis it is above 50 or 60 etc. So the main problem mm. used to be again for me the the artery valve stenosis to treat first. And, you know, uh, the, the most important thing is uh, it's important to fix the lesion at the level of the coronary if the complexity of this lesion is very low. Otherwise, I, I prefer to go first with the, with, the, with the sorting out the problem of severe ortis stenosis, choosing the right valve mm. for that patient. Okay. So just to summarize this, uh, we have no solid data whether to actually address coronary artery disease before TAVI if the patient has no angina. It can be discussed whether IFR maybe is better than FFR to, to try to set it, assess uh, the degree of stenosis in the setting of aortic stenosis. And also, even though it's rare that the patient need a coronary angiography afterwards, 3% or 3 years in, uh, in the study from Tarantini, it's maybe important to also consider which valve you use in these patients so it's possible to access the coronary arteries afterwards. So we're going to move to the next topic. We're going to talk about patient who is undergoing a TAVI, either a TAVI in a native aortic valve or a TAVI in TAVI procedure where we identify a risk for coronary occlusion 
how to address these patients and how to handle it. So, Therese, maybe you can start with a case presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, I think this case is a relatively simple case. Uh, the patient is very old, 90 years old. She had a severe symptomatic aortic stenosis with a previous history of stroke, but uh, <coughs> she was in a good condition after that. She had also a previous PCI of the LED. Um, uh, STS score is uh, 4.2, and as you can see, the uh, calculated average annulus diameter is 21.4, so it's a relatively small annulus, so you see the image of this annulus with no calcification. If you look at the sinotubular junction, it's relatively uh, narrow, about 21, 22 millimeters. Uh, while the sinus of Valsalva are relatively large, so uh, around 28, 29 millimeters. So now it's interesting to look at the uh, uh, coronary arteries. You can see that the distance between the annulus and the right coronary artery is nearly 15 millimeter, while uh, between the annulus and the left uh, co uh, coronary artery, it's about uh, 10 millimeters. So maybe we can discuss about that. Uh, what do you think? Of course, you can see that the uh, leaflets are uh, thick and highly calcified. So maybe it uh, may have an impact on your decision. So what yeah. do you think? So what do you think? Do you say? Well, how can we use the CT scan to 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 predict uh, patient who have a high risk? Should be an excellent. No. Okay, so we have um, the CT scan is extremely important because uh, you know all is about pre-procedural plan. Absolutely, yeah. as you mm. showed us, because pre-procedural plan is uh, of utmost importance. So we have to take different measurements. We have to look at the width of the sinuses, the height of the of the two coronaries the length of the leaflets, because when we tilt up the leaflets, we have to be sure to not cover uh, to not cover the ostia of the two coronary arteries. And then we have to look at uh, the, uh, the, um, the width also of the sinotubular junction. We have to look at, the, uh, at all these things because we are quite sure that we don't have any problem <clears throat> when we have that the leaflets is shorter than the height of the coronary, when the sinus is far larger compared to, you know, the, the annular size and the valve choice. And, we, and you don't have, like in this case, this kind of huge calcification because the characterization of the, of the calcification Calcification is not just because, you know, when we look at the adverse root fissure, that means annular rupture. But we have to evaluate also to calculate the risk of acute immediate uh, occlusion of the ostium of the left main. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the movement of the calcification if we de deploy a valve uh, yeah. at the level of the annulus. So for the right, I think there is no issue. Now, if you look at the left, and you deploy the valve, you can see that you will uh, displace uh, this big calcification um, toward the left man, and then have a big risk of uh, left man uh, stenosis or occlusion. Uh, so the uh, operator selected the uh, uh, Sapien 3, uh, 23, which was uh, one millimeter under field, because uh, you remember the annulus was uh, yeah. a little bit bigger than 20. Uh, you see that the valve is not fully expanded, and you see the displacement of these two big calcification uh, to the right and to the left. Now this is the angiogram, uh, because the patient became uh, unstable within five minutes, and you can see that there is some compromise of the flow in the left main, which was related to this movement of the uh, leaf calcified leaflet toward the left main. So they decide, or you can see clearly now the, uh, this lesion. It's very important to go in cranial views to, uh, to see the ostium of the left man, uh, because in uh, conventional views, you don't see clearly the ostium. Uh, they select a 3.5 stent, and then they were able, and you can see again uh, the animation showing the displacement of this uh, calcification with a stent, and then you correct uh, this uh, problem. And you can see that, in fact, the stent is not at the ostium of the left man, but uh, at the ostium and also in the sinus of Valsalva, because if you put it at the ostium, it will not solve the, the problem. Uh, so I think it's uh, very uh, interesting, and maybe you can summarize uh, in this uh, slide yeah. <coughs> uh, 
the risk of coronary occlusion. Yes, exact. So this, uh, this is the list of <clears throat> the things to consider in the preprocedural phase in, uh, to, to avoid, you know, in, uh, somehow the occlusion of the coronary artery and to try to, you know, to foresee the strategy to avoid that. So the annulus to coronary distance below 10 millimeters, let's say also 12 millimeters, uh, when you stay beyond 12, uh, 12 millimeters, uh, there is a risk to close the coronary artery. It depends also uh, on the annular size because when you have a small annulus, it means that the leaflets are shorter. It is completely different when the annular size is big because the leaflets are longer. So the leaflet length accordingly, sinus of valsalva width, as I told you before. And uh, <clears throat> the short sinotubular distance for the same reason that means that when you tilt up, you know, the leaflets, you can close uh, the, the, uh, the access to the coronary artery, small annulus and large calcific valve. But it is not just important to look at the calcification in terms of distribution, but also in terms of dimension and characteristics. Because we have the, the one concept that, that you have to keep in mind is we have to characterize. We don't have to say it is calcific or not, of course. but we have to mm. understand understand a little bit more where is the distribution, uh, how much is bulky, etc., etc., where it is positioned. Because if it stay in non-coronary cusp, it means the risk of annular rupture. If it stay in front of the left main, means the occlusion of the left main. So it's very important to use a CT scan to try to predict the risk uh, in these patients, as you just summarized here. So to read in this case, um, the operator didn't do anything to, um, to try to, to solve it before the procedure, but they managed to actually to wire the coronary arteries and put a, a stent in afterwards. But you know, sometimes this can be a fatal complication. So, so, so if you want to protect the coronary up front, what, what strategy can you, do, can you use? So th there is many ways to do it, but I think the, the main is to put a wire. Mm -hmm. So anticipate that mm -hmm. you have a risk according to the MSCT uh, careful analysis and then insert a wire in this uh, vessel in order to be sure that you will be able to access the left main in case of occlusion. So there is uh, uh, many ways to do it. You can leave the guiding catheter inside or you can leave the catheter outside. You can use uh, a catheter extension. Uh, so some people like, uh, like uh, this technique very much. But the most important is to have a wire in place. And when you have a wire in place, you are always able to solve the, the issue. And also, just, just good to go to one back here. So let's see um, uh, if, if you have a wire in place, some will even pack a, a coronary stent into the... To it. Yeah. So, so you said a little bit before that uh, the stent is not only in the coronary vessel, but also extending out what we call a chimney stand. Can you just explain what, yeah. what's the purpose so, of that? So sometimes you, you, you especially when you use a, a core valve uh, mm. Evolute R, you, you need to, because it's a supraannular valve, mm. so you, if you put a stent, you need to have the upper part of the stent proximal to the leaflets. Mm. Uh, so usually when we do this kind of technique, uh, we uh, park a stent, mm. a long stent in the left main, and then deploy the stent when necessary. Of course, it's uh, not always necessary to do it, but uh, I would say in uh, two thirds of the cases, uh, mm. when we anticipate a big risk of occlusion, uh, we should uh, deploy the stent. Does it matter what kind of TAVI valve you use? As a question, is a self-expanding valve better than a balloon expandable? Or you can also maybe ask a mechanical valve where you can fully deploy it, and if you have an issue, you can actually take it out again. Do, do you think it makes a difference what kind of valve you use for each space, for these patients? I think, as you know, we, we have uh, easier access through uh, the Sapiens revalve as compared to Evolute R, um, or as compared to the Lotus valve, for example. So I think uh, it depends of, on each case. So, so selection of the valve will not depend only on the risk of coronary, access, or the risk of coronary issues, mm -hmm. but also on the, the risk on the annulus mm -hmm. or the risk of having parvalvular leak. So it's a mix of all these parameters which will help us to select the optimal valve. So I would say a la carte selection yeah. of the oh. valve. Yeah. But again, pre-procedural planning. Exactly. So this was about um, coronary occlusion in patients who have a native aortic valve, which is not that common, but it can be an issue, of course. Giuseppe, it's much more common if you do 
valve and valve procedure. So if you put a TAVI valve inside a G-generated surgical bioprosthesis, can you just explain which valve we have to particularly look up for? This is a very important chapter because, uh, you know, the first, the first data that is important to know is that uh, doing a valve in valve is an independent predictor of coronal occlusion mm. by itself. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if you look at the data of Vivid registry, it is the largest worldwide registry that we have for a valve in valve, the percentage of occlusion of a coronary artery when you go with a valve in valve like this one that you can see on the display is about 3.5%. That is six to seven times higher compared to the native artery. That is, as Terry said before, below 1%, fair, yeah. fair below. Uh, 1%. So the point is that uh, we have three main valves. One are the, mm, uh, the stented valve with the uh, leaflets mounted internally. Then we have the stented valve with the leaflets mounted externally. And here, here you can see the mitral flow, the trifecta, etc. And then we have a series of stentless valves. All these valves are completely different. The higher risk of coronary occlusion belongs to the stented externally mounted leaflets. It's about, in the vivid registry, it was about 6%, 6.5%, compared to the 3.5% that we observe with the stentless valve. The reason for that, <clears throat> it's quite easy to understand because these valves are mounted subranularly. So actually, the, the height of the coronary artery at the end is frequently below 12 millimeter. The leaflets are mounted uh, externally, so when you deliver you know, a TAVI inside of this valve, you have uh, an outer display displacement uh, of these leaflets that matter a lot in terms of uh, occlusion of the coronary artery. Just to summarize briefly, mm -hmm. these are the major, the major yeah. problem with this valve. Yeah. So particularly look up for patients who have a stinted valve with external mounting of yeah. the leaflets and the stentless valve. Yeah. Thierry, there's a, a, a few questions here. Um, would you use a, you have a wire in the coronary arteries, would you have a stent in or would you not have a stent in? What's your practice on the wire before, during the type procedure? You mean the stent in the... If you do coronary protection, yeah? Yeah. Would uh, I think it depends. Uh, when the, the risk of occlusion is very high, I will park a stent in the left man. Okay. Uh, when it's uh, uh, borderline, so we'll uh, just have a wire in place mm -hmm. and maybe the, the guiding catheter just very close to the... And when the risk is relatively low, uh, we just have the wire and the guiding catheter a little bit mm -hmm. outside. Okay. Does it matter what kind of stent you use, coronary stents and size, length of it? Difficult to say, but um, I think uh, each uh, good uh, drag routing stent is, uh, is okay, in my opinion. Right, yes, yeah. And also remember to have it as long as you can make the chimney. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's particularly if you have I those. I think w one, one point which can be very important is that if you deploy the stents and then you have to post-dilate the valve for any reason, mm. then you, you, like, you could make a compression of the stent. Mm. So you have to, uh, to do a kissing uh, inflation, so valve and stent, mm. or you have to post-dilate the stent mm. after was di dilating the, the valve. Yeah. Uh, what, what about the role of imaging IVUS do you use in this case to decide if it is worth stenting or not? Because sometimes you have to pull out the catheter and at that point it's going to be you know, <laughs> more difficult yeah. to get in. I, I think it. it's a good point. So uh, uh, our Japanese friends are doing that very frequently uh, to check uh, if you need uh, to put a stent or not, or sometimes if you need to add a second stent because uh, yeah, the radial force the is not mm -hmm. enough, and sometimes you have to add the second stent in order to have a good radial force. Yeah. So coronary protection is uh, the technique most sites will use today, but there's another technique which is merging what we call uh, the basilica technique. And uh, this is again on a G-generated surgical valve where we foreseen there is a risk of coronary occlusion. So what you can do, you can go in with a catheter and you have a guide wire and you puncture the leaflet in the bottom of it and you snare it with a, uh, from, a, with a, uh, from another catheter and then you have this loop and apply energy, IF energy, and then you can <clears throat> make a laceration of the cusp on the, the surgical valve. So it's going to split open. So when you implant your new valve, it's not going to sit in front of it. So this basilica technique is something which is uh, really taking off uh, these days. And I'm sure it's going to treat 
more patients with longer life expectancy who's coming back with these fails, fail, uh, failed valve, it's going to be more uh, used than it is today. So just to summarize here on patients with acute uh, risk for coronary occlusion, it's very important to look at the CT scan before and try to predict, identify these patients at a high risk, use coronary protection device, take into consideration what kind of valve you, you're going to use, TAVI valve, in order to minimize it and also to be set to treat it in case it occurs. So let's move on to the final topic. Let's going to talk about patient who had a TAVI procedure who's coming back for a coronary angiography. Uh, which tips and tricks and techniques can, can, we, can, we, can we use? Yeah, so I think it will be probably in the future one important question. And we'll have to learn mm -hmm. how to manage this kind of patient. So this case is an 84 years old gentleman who is in a, still in very good physical condition, no specific risk factors, no previous coronary disease. He had a previous uh, TAVI procedure with Evolute R29 three years ago. And he was recently admitted in another center for unstable angina. Uh, so they have done coronary angiogram, and you can see that uh, coronary angiogram was not very easy because you see that uh, with a GL, uh, there was no uh, uh, selective injection in the left man. Uh, they tried many catheters, and uh, uh, you can see that we are far away from the ostium of the left man, but you can see that there is a significant disease of the LAD, a bifurcation between the mid-LAD and the first uh, diagonal. Uh, they try also to cannulate the right coronary artery. You can see that we had non-selective injection, but showing at least that coronary, uh, the right coronary artery is okay. They try many, again, many catheters, and you have an example of the Amplatz right uh, one uh, coronary uh, catheter for trying to go in, in the right coronary artery. So the, uh, they, they send the patient to us because we have done the, the, the TAVI, and uh, maybe uh, you can explain, uh, Giuseppe, what Few is your and tricks, approach? Yes. You know, we, have, we have many, many reviews with this regard, etc. We don't have any proof about, uh, about you know, how to go, etc. But in my experience, what is important, following also the suggestion of some papers, but also the experience is very important in this case. We have to change, first of all, the attitude to cannulate the coronary artery. It is not bottom up like we used to do in a native, you know, situation, anatomy, but we have to go um, uh, top down. So we have to try to cannulate the coronary coming down uh, and not, you know, tilting up the catheter as we used to do regularly. This is very important, especially with the subranular valve because actually also this catheter are not designed for this kind of anatomy because we have displaced upward the new leaflets. So the catheter are not designed for that in terms of length and curvature, etc. So the point is, first of all, we have to try to go in bottom up. Sometimes randomly we might have a struts in front of the left main or a commissure, so it is impossible to be coaxial or fully aligned. So in that case, we might, uh, you know, um, use some extension catheter that may give us a little bit of more support to the wire to go through also through the struts and through the lesion uh, with the stents and the other different material. As a general suggestion for the catheter, uh, I would suggest to go with a 3.5 Jatkins or uh, a little shorter catheter for the left and a normal catheter for the right that is four or five for, for, uh, for the right coronary artery. These are very simple tricks that might be useful in the daily yeah. practice. So I, I think this uh, paper from UD recently published is yeah. very, very interesting. So I encourage yeah. people to look uh, carefully look at this, this yeah. because they have a, a sort of a schematic uh, approach, which is, I think, very nice. And you'll find a link to this paper on the PCR website related Absolutely. to this webinar. So you can look it up here if you want to all the details. Yeah. So what we have done, we, uh, we have used uh, Extra Backup 3.5. Uh, if we have felt to be close to the left main, we'll use a GL, as you suggest. Uh, so we are relatively close to the left main, so we just push a wire in the, in the LED, 
and then it's more simple because you have already a, a good position and you can just by turning clockwise a little bit adjust the position of the guiding catheter. Uh, you can see uh, in a better view, and this is an uh, areocranial view, that we have a long lesion of the mid LED, uh, with, uh, uh, including the ostium of the diagonal branch, which is uh, a relatively big diagonal branch, and relatively uh, unique. So, we, so now you, you can see that we are more and more selective in the left man, just be, be, because we have a good... Uh, uh, two wires in place. Uh, so we have done what we are doing in, usually in bifurcation lesions, pre-dilate the main branch, then stand the main branch uh, according to the reference of the mid LED distal to the diagonal. Then we have done uh, a pot. This is uh, opening the strut toward the side branch. And we have done the final pot just at the level of the carena and a little bit more proximal. So this is the final result, which I think uh, is uh, very acceptable with uh, one, uh, one long stent. There's a question here from the audience. Uh, what about a patient who is uh, going for valve fracture? So, you know, if you have a surgical biprosthetic valve, which is G-generated, and you want to do a TAVI uh, procedure inside it, uh, some of these valves, it's possible to do the fracturing. Can you just explain, Siri, what, what, what is the fracturing of these valves? Yeah, I think it's a very important point because uh, when you have a, a relatively uh, high mismatch, uh, it's a pity, to, uh, for example, you, you have a patient coming <coughs> with, uh, who had a gradient of 25 after the surgery, and then you have the patient four or five years later with a, a gradient of 60 or 70, mm -hmm you will not be able to have a gradient less than 25 <coughs> at the end. So it will be very difficult. So, so in this case, it, if there is a mismatch, you, you should uh, <coughs> crack the valve. And the technique is relatively simple. So you, we use uh, one syringe to inflate the balloon and one in deflator to uh, go to high pressure. Mm -hmm. And we use a balloon, which is non-compliant, that you can go up to 18 or 20 millimeter of uh, mercury. Uh, I think post-dilatation in the, this kind of valve-in-valve -valve procedure is also very important. So even if you do not crack the valve, mm. you will improve the gradient mm. uh, after deployment. Yeah. And uh, usually we do not pre-dilate because uh, with pre-dilatation of a uh, degenerated bioprosthesis valve, you, you have some risk of uh, cerebral embolization. Yeah. So we prefer not to pre-dilate, but post-dilatation is very useful. Yeah. So fracturing is a kind of a aggressive post-dilatation where you choose a larger balloon, typically one millimeter larger, yeah. and blow, go up with it. Remember, it's not all valve which is, can be fractured. Absolutely. So we have a question here. Is there a high risk of coronary occlusion when you do this valve fracturing in, in, uh, in patients with small bipos surgical bipostasis? I, I, I think it does not depend on the fact that you are mm -hmm. cracking the valve, but mm -hmm. it depends on the anatomy that you have. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, again, I think careful uh, evaluation of MSCT is, is very important. I, th I think if I may add something, uh, as Terry said, you know, the pre-procedure plane with a CT scan in this case is to measure what is called the VTC. Mm -hmm. VTC is the space between the valve and the coronary. Uh, this has been reported from the Joe Webb group. Uh, when this distance is above four millimeters, you know, the risk of coronary occlusion is very low, but it is not so important to see, to look at four, five, or six, but what is important is to exclude that this di distance is one or two. In that case, it is clear that you have to, pr to be prepared, and during the fraction, you can protect the coronary artery again, stay with the catheter in, and probably also with the stents yeah. in this regard. Of course. There's also a question about the basilica technique. So if you don't have any experience, how do we start this program? And uh, I would recommend that you contact the company who you're buying your belt from and uh, ask them to help you to find proctors there. Nowadays, there's uh, quite a few sites in, in Europe who got experience with it. Uh, otherwise, um, read the papers from Adam Greenbaum's group in, in the US. It's very detailed described how to do it, but a proctor would, of course, be, uh, be nice to have uh, at the same time. There's also a question here about uh, choosing 
the transcatheter heart valve with uh, keeping in mind that you may need to access uh, these coronaries later on, Thierry. Is there anything you consider today in your daily practice? I mean, or at least it's something you're going to do tomorrow because basically we're treating today, as I said before, are quite old of age and, and may not have that long life expectancy. But let's say these low-risk trials are going to expand it down to younger patients with longer life expectancy. Is it something we should really consider now? Yeah, I think it's very important. Uh, even the, the companies are working in this field. So they, they understood that uh, because uh, uh, this technique is, will be uh, used also for younger patients, uh, looking at the data from uh, low-risk uh, studies. Uh, so, of course, uh, all the uh, THV will be improved in terms of coronary access. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, uh, of course, you have seen that uh, the core valve is probably a little bit more complex, but you can succeed in the majority of cases, but you have to learn mm. how to, to work with. Uh, for Sapiens 3, it's a little bit easier, but it depends also where the, the valve is uh, implanted. So sometimes when the, the valve is uh, above the, the ostium of the left man, sometimes it can be also difficult. So I think it's a field that we have uh, to work mm. uh, in order to improve the design of the valve mm. for future coronary access. Mm -hmm for uh, all patients. Giuseppe, there's also a question. Do you think we in the future is going to see special dedicated catheter to access the coronary arteries uh, after a type procedure? Or, or do the catheters we got today, is they sufficient yeah. if you just have the technique? Yeah, and so it's diff difficult to figure out because I think that the, you know, the research is moving towards, you know, modifying and improving the design of the valves because the point is that this is the focus because when we deal about coronary access and TAVI, we don't have just to think if it is possible to re-engage the coronary artery after the TAVI implantation because as Terry said before, we have to think also at the coronary access in case of redo Table. Mm. So the point is, whatever the cathedral that you have, sometimes if you have the, that's, you know, the risk plane, the risk plane of the valve that is the, the level at which when you tilt up the leaflets, it's impossible to go through the struts below this level, it is completely different among the valves. So we have some valves like, you know, the Edwards, for instance, that has a risk plane of 22, and the other valve that has 26, 28 and even 30, 31 with the accurate. So this this might be an issue because again when you don't have a very large aorta to go through, you know, aside the struts of the valve in a subranular valve and to go aside between the struts and the aorta, it is very difficult to, to go in from inside. So, um, you know, as Terry said before, you know, there, there is a lot, you know, of, uh, of work in this direction in terms of modification, in terms of creating holes within the, the, the struts to get, you know, lower, lower level of the leaflets. But, you know, this is a moving field. It's difficult to make some But I think it's something forecast. we need to keep in mind. And also, even though you, uh, you have those valves with a super position of the leaflets, potentially you could use the basilica technique to yeah. do it. Yeah. That's the but point. again, it demands that the valve is aligned with the commissures. If it's not aligned, if it's mis misaligned, so the post is in front of the coronary arteries, it's not going yeah, to work. So I think work. it's also the, there's, there's like a request from the companies to, to design valve where we can actually orientate the to valve. Orientate, yeah. And also that we understand the way to implant it so, so we have it aligned so it's possible to do the basilica technique later on for these patients who are going to have a TAVI in TAVI yeah. procedure. There was also a question, uh, um, Giuseppe, um, if you have a coronary lesions and you want to do a TAVI procedure, when is it significant? When is this significant? <laughs> okay, <clears throat> I can answer to this point uh, in this way. First of all, two very quick data. The first one is a meta-analysis of 2,500 patients that shows that doing a TAVI in a patient with or without the coronary artery disease defined as, uh, you know, a diameter stenosis above 50% previous MI or previous PCI, etc. doesn't matter anything in terms of prognosis. This is the first point. The second point is another meta-analysis of 5,000 
5,000 patients enrolled of all different trials that shows that 25% of the patients has received a PCI before TAVI. And the result of this is an increase in 30-day mortality. So based on this background, it means that we have to understand to improve our selection of the patient that we treat. So if I would like to be very conservative, I think that if we treat proximal lesion in major vessel like LAD, left main or proximal uh, yeah. dominant yeah. right coronary artery with a lesion that is above 80%, we match up also the physiology because in that case, in the vast majority of cases, you don't have any false positive, false negative with, uh, with, uh, with the physiology. So I would recommend mm. to be conservative, uh, to treat mainly this kind of patient also on angiographic base. Approach. Thierry, do you think we're going to see a, a randomized trials between revascularization or not before tapping these patients with asymptomatic, discrete, significant lesions? It's difficult to answer to this question. <laughs> Maybe the, the question will uh, rise uh, within the next 10 years. Mm. Uh, but today, uh, I think it will be very difficult to randomize because which mm. kind of patient you will randomize? I think yeah, I will not randomize a patient with a significant left main disease or proximal mm -hmm. LED. So I think the, the, the analysis that we are doing today, I think, are very important. So which kind of uh, synth residual syntax score we are leaving? I think uh, we have a lot of papers uh, showing that uh, if we are leaving uh, uh, in a TAVI patient, mm -hmm. a residual syntax score of more than eight, uh, it impacts the outcome. So I think uh, we should think about that. So uh, uh, especially for younger patients we are going to treat. Of mm -hmm. course, in the patient who older than 80, maybe it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, and also, I mean, if you, if you don't treat these lesions, you need to have a valve in place, uh, select a valve where you can access these coronary afterwards if the patient have coronary yeah. artery disease. Yeah. I think that's important to keep in mind. Absolutely. So just to summarize here, the last uh, session here, you heard about uh, accessing to the coronary arteries. Uh, after a TAVI procedure, it can be difficult. There are certain techniques and tips and tricks to do it. There was one link on the PCR homepage, which is related to this webinar, where you can find this paper from Judy, who gave a lot of these uh, information. And also think for everyone who's doing a PCI, it's important to know this technique because these patients can come in also acutely and need uh, access to it so it's important to do it so just to summarize uh, this uh, uh, webinar it's still uncertain when to revascularize patients who is asymptomatic who got significant lesions on the coronary arteries before the TAVI procedure it's also important to evaluate the pre-procedural ct scan to identify patients who are at risk for coronary occlusion both patients who have native aortic valve stenosis and patients who have a, a failed uh, surgical valve. And in these patients, it's very important to consider to use coronary protection, maybe chimney standing or the basilica technique. All PCIs operator should be familiar with the technique to access the coronary arteries after a TAVI procedure. So, we now reach the end of this webinar on TAVI and coronary access, and I hope you found it useful. On behalf of my colleagues, Thierry and Giuseppe, I would like to thank Edvard's Life Science for supporting this uh, webinar, and all the best from all of us. Thanks.